let us bring it to the stage Jacob Tierney. <laughs> Executive producer Mark Montefiore. <laughs> Nathan Dales, who plays Derry. <laughs> hey, Trevor Wilson, who plays Squirrely Dan. Michelle Milad, who needs no further introduction. <laughs> kind of curved a little bit. Is Michelle? Oh, hi. Hi. All right. So I'm going to just like hover awkwardly over you guys like this. It's going to be great. Yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, so my first question actually is for Mark, which was this, this show started as a web series and I was curious what you saw in that web series and in this creative team that made you feel like it should be a TV show. Okay. Green light means go, yeah. So uh, I first saw Letterkenny, a friend of mine, Dane Clark, sent me a link to it, uh, the five YouTube videos uh, that uh, Nate was in, of course. And uh, I just fell in love with it. I grew up in a small town just outside of Niagara Falls on the Canadian side. And uh, I recognized myself and all of my friends and all of these characters. And it was so funny. <laughs> Amen. So Jacob and Jared are, are sort of the two heads of the creative team here. And I was just curious, Jacob, if you could talk about sort of the division of labor, what you bring to it, and what Jared Kiso brings to the show. Yeah, I mean, uh it, it's evolved over the years. I mean, the first two seasons, Jared and I just wrote them ourselves. Now we have a bunch of different writers. What, the way we do it is we break, a, we break a season down in the sense of, is there gonna be a kind of a long arc? Is it a winter season? Is it a summer season? Is there gonna be something like, you know, a call-in show for agricultural stuff? <laughs> um, and then it kind of goes from there. And then on set, we, we pretty much make decisions together, but it's, I'm the director, so like I keep my ship moving, and um, and uh, Jared whispers things into my ear, like, "Can you make him do that faster?" <laughs> and that's kind of the way it goes. Excellent, yeah. Excellent. Um, and then for Michelle, I was wondering, you have this great brother-sister relationship with Jared, and with all, sort of all the the boys in the cast. And I was wondering, is that is it the same behind the scenes? How do you foster that sort of familial feel on screen? Yeah, it's kind of been like that from the start, to be honest. I was um, nervous entering the world of Letterkenny when I first booked it because I knew that a lot of the guys were friends before and I didn't know anybody and kind of being the only girl to come into the mix at the beginning was a little bit daunting, but I was very much treated like the little sister in the best way possible from day one. So it's just been an easy, easy thing to translate on screen as well. Yeah, nice. And then, you know, the, the show started as a sort of sketchy web series, but hey, Trev, I know you have a background in stand-up, and I was just curious sort of how you translate sort of stand-up comedy to something like this, and how you guys all brought your different, maybe for all of you, how you brought your different comedic styles to the show. Uh, well, I definitely tried to adjust my performance style to fit letter Kenny. Uh, if you've ever seen my stand-up, I speak very slowly. Uh, <laughs> almost to the point of lulling everyone to a deep, deep sleep. So, <laughs> so when I joined the cast of Letterkenny, I, I definitely had to speed things up and step things up. But we've always had fun over the years doing Letterkenny of incorporating elements of my stand-up uh, into the show. And we have a running gag where Squirrely Dan can never quite remember my, that he's watched my comedy on TV and he quotes my own stand-up. <laughs> and he's not even that big of a fan of me. So... <laughs> We have a nice running gag where we put a lot of my jokes in, and that usually comes from Jared calling me up and being like, hey, I want to use one of your jokes. Do you mind if we quote it in the show? And like some of Squirrely Dan's stories are actually my stories that I told Jared, and he was like, well, that's fun. Let's put it in the movie. Uh, Jive and Pete came out of my real life friends, and Mark just gave me the name to pay homage to one of his friends. But like the first season, all the Jive and Pete stories are actually buddies of mine that have the giant balls and... <laughs> piss down their own basement steps. <laughs> well, good night, everybody. Yeah. There go from there. Uh, and, and Nate, my question for you is, which, uh, which character, which actor do you think is most like their character? And 
Uh, who's least like that character? <laughs> you think it's pretty easy? Yeah, kind of. Um, okay, well, we'll go with the most like their character. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably say Dylan is most like his character. Dylan and Andrew would be most like, and then... I don't know who's most... Who, who, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Le Lisa Codrington, who plays Gail, she's the least like her character, because she's, she's don't really... Don't worry, she's not like that. <laughs> don't worry. Yeah, she's really quiet and like really sweet, and then she like gets the up there... the most elegant person ever. <laughs> And she just says the most disgusting <laughs> you've ever heard, and then like, <laughs> and then tries she to. She doesn't know what she's saying half the time too. We have to explain the dirty jokes to her. Yeah, <laughs> and then she just like scramble across the bar and look hilarious, and then, then got to take it again. She sort of bring her own dirty, dirty jokes to the table at a certain point, and like, I googled some of the stuff she was saying. I was like, oh, holy, this <laughs> <laughs> is vulgar. I remember we had to explain an Alabama hot pocket to her. <laughs> <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> and before you ask, no, we're not explaining it. <laughs> you can you can you can pollute your own search engine with that. So for, for Mark and Jacob, you got you got this huge renewal deal for forty episodes at once, uh, a, a ways back. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, what does knowing that, knowing you have forty episodes to work with, what does that do for your creative process of like where you want to go and how you want to push things? I mean, <laughs> it's it's the weirdest. I mean, I don't even know, but creatively, you can process it one way. But then, like, to work in television and know that you've been renewed for three years is so insane. Um, to have a job, it's very calming, and then it's very kind of like panicky. Um, and I, I, at first, we Jared and I thought we'd kind of drift into doing, and we still may. I don't know, into doing like super weird episodes of the show. Of doing like Jared always had, has had this dream to do. Uh, he wants to do one episode that's a melodrama, so everyone is freaking out about things, like the complete opposite. We've thought about doing a musical. Um, we're halfway there. Uh, uh, so, I mean, it, it really lets you just kind of expand and, and let, it's nice to let the show breathe. Like, I don't know that we would have done six cracking eggs, you know? I don't know that we would have let that just happen. Um, it doesn't get faster paced either, just by the way. <laughs> they don't get good at it or anything like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's very freeing. It, it's very weird. It, truthfully, it's just really weird because... It's like, you know, do we want to do, we, we, we table ideas now all the time. We're like, yeah, we can do that next block. Oh, we'll do that next. Because we know we have so much more to do. So it's like we kind of feel, we kind of feel things out as we go along. And, and some of the stuff that uh, we're talking with Jared right now is he's able to look um, many episodes and many seasons ahead and start planting seeds for things that may or may not come to fruition. Um, you know, long, long, the long tail ideas that, uh, that just toying with. And uh, wouldn't that be cool if we ended up here and let's plan it now. Um, and if it goes there, then great, we've already set it up. Do you have an example of sort of a seed you planted early that, you know, you saw pay off? We've already seen pay off, or we might see pay off? Like the no. ostrich. <laughs> <laughs> see the ostrich? The ostrich? All right, that's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, that continues to pay off. That ostrich. <laughs> so that ostrich is going to end up pregnant. <laughs> Allegedly. Like, Who's the father? <laughs> And, this, and the star of the musical episode, right? It's all yep. about the ostrich? Great. Yeah. Great, great, great. It's um, called ostrich exclamation mark. <laughs> is the um, so since Jared is not here, um, I was wondering if you all might want to indulge us with uh, your most embarrassing Jared story to punish him for not being here, starting with Michelle, perhaps. <laughs> oh, man. An embarrassing story. Like, to embarrass him. Absolutely. He's um, not here. Oh, I actually kind of do have a good one. <laughs> oh, I feel like he's even going to be mad at me. It's like, oh, I'm trying to get what he said. He was telling me a story of when he was, I think, in grade eight or nine. And Jared's like a real softy. He's like a very, very big sweetheart. And he was at a school dance, and he was dancing <laughs> with his girlfriend. And what did he say to her? And he, met, and he was like, and I, and I said something like, God, I, like, there's no place that I would rather be than right here with you and like slow dancing with her and he's like just meant it so much like just loved her so much and just the cutest little Jared Kiso loving his girlfriend in grade 8 and I just thought that was the cutest thing 
Because I kind of is who he is. Boo. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Fuck that. That's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Oh my God, can you believe when he was 13? And he, uh, here, here's mine. Here's something he would not. I, he's my boss, here's man. Here's something like, he I would not. Yeah. You know, I can't Technically, he's it. my boss, too. But anyway, here's one thing about Jared Kiesel he would not want you to know. He cannot <laughs> at work. <laughs> so there are... Very, very true. <laughs> he won't go to the bathroom anywhere but at his own house. And so there are afternoons when I can tell. I'm like... <laughs> You need to sort yourself out. You're gonna get fired, man. This, this is not being recorded, is it? <laughs> hey. No one in this room. No one in this room is gonna repeat that, right? That's fine. Anyone else want to get in trouble with their boss? No. Not so much. Cool. I, I, I think that pretty much. Okay, that, that, no. that's just it. That's just it. From one end of the panel to the other, that was the extreme. <laughs> there you got it. <laughs> He's, he's got no poker face when it comes to when he, when he cracks on camera. It's very obvious, and he'll try to hide it, but he, he can't hide. He thinks he's good at hiding it, but he can't because he turns bright red, and then the, <laughs> his lips curl up to the side. And to him, he's like straight facing, and he's like, <laughs> "We're good, right? We can move on." And it's like, "No, we got to do that whole and take over, bud." You, you look like a red clown right now. Yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it's like he thinks we're making radio. Yeah. I'm like, I can see your face. It's like literally my job is to look at your face. When, when we were like, doing... Oh, we're the, good, we're good, we're good. I think when, when we were doing the, uh, the ice fishing scenes, mm. and he, he went, went the sushis and sashimis, <laughs> uh, like these two were cry laughing, and it was a wide shot. And they're like, we're good? It's like, no, no. We, we have to do everything over. <laughs> so is Jared the one most likely to break? On camera, when you guys are sort of riffing, yeah. And then who's the most likely to make someone break? On Lisa. Camera? Lisa yeah. Godry. Lisa. Lisa. Yeah. Or, or Stuart. Tyler can do it Tyler. too. Yeah. And Tyler and makes and me break. And Melanie. I can't even look at it. Melanie breaks people. Tyler breaks people. Um, Lisa. Lisa but, was the OG breaker. But Lisa, the most like consistent, because she's so calm and, and well, she and she can't be broken. Like no yeah. matter what's happening, she will not. Flinch. And she's just collected the whole time, right? She's so sweet, and then she gets up there and does, again, this disgusting <laughs> and then it just, <laughs> you've got everybody laughing. It's just like, performers. And also the weird shit with the body. Yeah, she's like, her legs will be up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's got both legs Listening. behind her head somehow, like right throwing a picture Where's your other hands. leg? I don't yeah. understand. She'll look you straight in the eye while like her leg is going up onto a bar. And <laughs> it's like she's a clock. It's like, no, this is the second <laughs> hand. Super off-putting, but it's good. So you guys, you guys are about to embark on a sort of uh, a U.S. tour for your live show. Nate, I was wondering if you could talk about sort of the process of putting together the live show versus the show show. What's the difference? What if, if these folks want to fly out to New York or Chicago, various places, and see you guys live, what, what should they expect? Minneapolis? Or Minneapolis. Yeah. Um, well, the difference between the live show and the regular show, um, obviously, is the stage and the fact that we're live. Um, but uh, other than that, <laughs> other than that, what we do for the live show is we take scenes um, that are crafted like by Jared, uh, and we take them, we transfer those from the screen to the stage, and that's it. And so we do them live, and we have everything sort of set in front of the produce stand, and then we also incorporate a whole bunch of other stuff into the live show. We have K-Trev does stand-up, and Mark Ford does stand-up, and we have videos that people haven't seen and stuff like that. And so to take, to take the material that would normally go on screen and to put it on stage is... Not that much different. I mean, there's like there's literally there's no movement whatsoever, right? And so that's kind of that's fine. And uh, you just you just write new stuff. Really selling it. Whoa. It sounds like an exciting live show. <laughs> no, it is really an exciting live show. It's like a TV show you pay extra money for. <laughs> <laughs> if you hate movement, <laughs> do I have a show for you? <laughs> All right, static shots the whole time. Come on. <laughs> um, it's something. Something I love starting, especially in season two, was this is this is such a great sketch show about this, this, these rural Canadians. It's fantastic. It has this really progressive politics, which is just something that I really love. Season five is my favorite season. So I was wondering, Jacob, if you could talk about sort of that, how much intention is behind that, what what where that comes from. Yeah, I mean that, that's the that's the, I mean I, I think it would I would say that it stems from one very particular thing, which is that we hate bullies. So the progressiveness is you can be weird and you can be whatever you want to be. Uh, you, you will never be bullied in Letterkenny and bullies get punished. Um, and 
Yeah, I, but we're, I'm super pr I'm super proud of um, of the indigenous representation on the show. I don't think there's literally another show on TV that has as many uh, 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 Aboriginal characters as ours does. I love the weird sexual diversity, even though it's just really a bunch of perverts. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, we did it, it was both deliberate and organic. It was like, you know, because we have gotten to do so many episodes, we, we, we have our universe and we get to keep expanding it. So it's like, you have someone as good as like Dio Horn, and who plays Tannis, and you want to give her a world, you want to give her more to do, she's awesome. Um, uh, yeah, she's the best. Um, and same with, you know, same with Gail, and then bringing in, you know, and then bringing in all the cousins and all the... <laughs> We do write it with a T, by the way, in the script. Um, and same, like, once, you know, once we decided the McMurrays became swingers, we were like, this is just gonna get, we're gonna go down this hole. Um, and literally. Literally, yeah. Hey um, yeah, and, and it's something that we love about the show, and we also, like, we, what, I, what I like is we don't have messages, we're not here to teach you a Lesson, it's Letter Kenny. But yeah, we love people and we love weirdos, and God bless them. Let them all exist and let them exist, let them all find their happiness. Love it, yeah. Uh, so you guys just sort of became part of the Hulu family in a new and exciting way, as announced this week. You're now officially a Hulu original. Um, One of their many wives. <laughs> But what's, what's fascinating to me uh, about um, American the way that American audiences, myself included, respond to this, even though we don't understand maybe like 25% of the words you guys say, no. I don't know. We don't either. <laughs> Us neither, come on. <laughs> I was wondering if you guys could go down the line and say if there's any sort of like lost in translation moment you've seen with American audiences. Someone comes up to you and is like, what's, what are all dressed chips? What are those? Like, what's a dart? What is that? They're gross, you're wrong. <laughs> I, I don't know if I've seen a lot of uh, uh, misunderstandings with American audiences in general more than Canadian audiences. It's just yeah. such a unique language and code. And you know, reading the scripts the first time, even watching the first YouTube videos, I have to go back and like, what the hell does that mean? My grandparents watch the show with closed captioning, so they can just understand what people are saying. Yeah. And even that, it's not. It's hard. It's tough. It can be tough. Well, I, mean, I don't understand what people are saying. I just watched this episode. I was like, do I? Did anyone register a thing Stuart said? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> What is he saying? <laughs> I think I wrote a bunch of it too. Like I'm not sure, but just like weird subcultures of music. I just think. naming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, I hear like a trip hop or something yeah. like a jungle. But I have no idea what he's talking about. It doesn't matter either, you guys. Obviously, it all. You know, we just keep watching it, and every time I rewatch it, I understand more. Um, we have time for some questions from the audience, right down here. I'm just gonna repeat that really quickly for the folks in the back, which is that each season ends on a cliffhanger, which makes you want to click like next episode, please. Uh, so how how is that for the creatives in the cast? Yeah, sure, uh, yes, it was on. It is on purpose. Uh, we're we're actually gonna try to. Well, this one coming up is a big one, um, and then we're kind of trying to drift a little bit away from it because I we don't want it to feel forced either. Like this kind of like oh, who's gonna break up with what? You know, like, it can be a bit much, but um, but yeah, we definitely love it. And in the binging world, it is great. You're absolutely right to like bring you into the next season. Um, and they often don't know what's going to happen because we haven't decided what's going to happen at that point. It like it depends on what part of the block we're shooting it in. So like um, if it's like because we shoot, so we like what we're doing this year, which is what we did last year, is we shoot uh, the month of. August and then another block in the month of November, basically. Um, so if it's the month of August, we have a very strong sense of what's coming in November because we have half of it written. But if it's November, sometimes we're like, who knows? I don't know what's going to happen next summer. So uh, they don't always know. Yeah, that's kind of fun, I though. I tell it's them nice. what yeah. to think. When you read them and you're just kind of like, don't really know where it goes, it's just like, all right, well, that's fun. You get to sort of take an audience perspective from that as well. So just go like, oh, this is interesting. I wonder what the fuck is going to go on, right? And then you just go and go about it your regular way, and then uh, and then either something fun happens or you're involved in it or you're not or whatever. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's all, uh, all kind of news to us at some point, yeah. Good question. That deserves an Oscars teacher. Yeah, so like, it, it's not like Game of Thrones where they keep us shrouded in secrecy so we don't know what's happening. Like, <laughs> like if, if they've got it figured out, they'll, you know, sometimes Katie they'll let kills us the know. Night King. And, uh, <laughs> she would. She would. And like, yeah, but if they haven't written it, then it's like, oh, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen next, so like, wait till August. 
<laughs> Other questions? Over there. Um, when you mentioned you get all that money for yourself, do you get that same moment or a, or a video or whatever you would show people to get this is why you should watch this show? A favorite moment or a video to hook people into the show? Playing catch, the butts hole yeah. conversation. Yeah. That, that for me was one of my favorite uh, ones to film, playing catch. First off, I just had fun playing catch with the guys. Uh, Nate and I played a lot of catch that summer because we didn't want to look like idiots throwing the ball around on television. Uh, but uh, just filming that, that sequence, like uh, on, on, on my close ups, uh, Nate and Jared wouldn't look at me because I was just <laughs> ranting about butts holes. And, and if Jared starts laughing, Nate starts laughing. So they had to look in other directions. But I just think that scene sums up Letter Kenny. It's a bunch of guys, uh, you know, farmers playing catch and talking about how natural it feels to finger their butts holes. So. <laughs> That'd be my recommendation. Yeah, I mean, in the same tone, I would think like the, the porn scene. The yes, 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 yes. The yes, and yes. The, all the yeses. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, yes, that one, probably. The screaming yeses. Um, I, like the, uh, I like the alphabet aerobics at the beginning of the season. I think yeah, that's something I that love can. That. <laughs> I think that's something that's like not quite as dirty as those other two, but you can definitely, if you're trying to hook somebody in, I think it's like, that's a quick like one scene in and then it's nice and creative and really fun and was awesome to see. And then, yeah, I think that can hook somebody right away. I like to go all in and uh, if, uh, if they don't like Fart Book, then they're not a friend of mine. <laughs> fart, fart Book is a, that's a, that's a tester. That's, yeah, I would say super soft. I'd say like, watch yeah. super soft to yeah. see. Yeah. Mark, then was it your idea to do the previously on fart montage? If your no, fart that, was, your that was not mine, but I thoroughly enjoyed it and supported it. <laughs> I actually forgot that that we were doing that, and I block. I think I blocked it out of my mind, and then I saw. I was like, previously on, we've never done that before, and I was like, oh right, this email thread I stopped paying attention to. Well, I could have sworn it just started as a joke, and then somehow ended up that's on why. Screen. It was that's like, what I, that is how it started. Oh, oh, we're actually doing this. Okay. <laughs> It, it's actually amazing how many discussions about how to play farts I've had with Jared Kiso. It's like the, the first, the first couple throw. seasons I would have a physical thing to show that I was farting and then Jared and I actually had a big conversation about like don't move anymore, just let the fart play and don't oversell the fart because like you're, you're it was I making never it thought my late 30s would be this consumed with talking about farting. Yeah. Like, if you told me that, I'd been like, then let's choose a different adventure. <laughs> but it's worked out. It's been very nice. But Sever it's a I lot of farting. Still, it's about the of art of television <laughs> farting with Jared Kiso. <laughs> right there in the green. We know, we know. Levine, yes. <laughs> well, uh, funny that you should mention that. We do actually have a, I don't know, what do you call it, a spinoff, or I don't know what we're calling it, but we're doing a thing called Little Kenny, which is an animated uh, show, which is all of them as kids. <laughs> and and uh, we, we, uh, we haven't released it yet, but it's coming out shortly. Um, there's, uh, there's six two-minute episodes that we're very excited by. But yeah, but we, you're never, we're never going to see the parents in the show. If that's your question, like people, the question we get asked a lot is like, where are the adults in Letterkenny? And we're all like, who knows, but they're not there. <laughs> Uncle Ed, the ghost of Uncle Eddie is like as best you're going to get. Like we know they were related to people because Uncle Eddie is alive. I like the implication no, that none is, of these I mean, people no, are adults. Was <laughs> to, death by, was to death by Gail. I'm almost oh, that's 40, insane too. No I'm almost 40. Kenny. And I'm like, no, I'm one of the kids on Letterkenny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but what happened? I mean, we did have that one election episode that there was some real seniors. So we know they're there. there. Yeah, they, they are there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> somewhere. Right there, yep. Right? <laughs> I was, as, when I was 12, I was on her show. Right? <laughs> You're welcome for that. <laughs> for the Americans, Deanie Petty hosted a daytime talk show in Canada for a long, long time, so we all grew up watching and Deanie she Petty. did shampoo commercials, too, I want to say? She probably did shampoo commercials, yeah. Craziest fan experience. 
Well, um, Nathan and I actually did a show uh, a couple years ago for uh, Allied troops. It was the end of a three-month training ac exercise uh, involving Canadian, U.S., British, Australian, and, and New Zealand uh, troops. And uh, they brought us out, and uh, it was actually the entire training exercise had been Letterkenny themed. Like all their <laughs> bases and stations were like Camp Katie Cat, Camp Squirrely Dan. <laughs> Yeah, and, like Operation and, Pitter Patter, Operation <laughs> Get Her Done. And yeah, it was like 5,000 Allied troops, and, and all of them knew the show. Uh, and what we <laughs> found out is that Letterkenny episodes are on like the, the care packages that go overseas to the troops to give them a, a, the, the, the homesickness packages, they call them, so that they can watch the TV shows from home. And what happens is the soldiers get out there, they watch the programs from home and start swapping uh, discs with the uh, other soldiers from different countries to get a look at different shows. So through that we have this crazy following of US and, and uh, military and Australian and British military and New Zealand military who all know the show and uh, Nate and I walked out in costume on this base and 5,000 troops like rushed us to get autographs and pictures. <laughs> Terrifying. We had, we had <laughs> <laughs> Like, they're just like and, and nicest guys, but just like if, if you ever met five thousand drunk troops, they're they're very intense. Uh, so I mean, it was like it one, it was like very heartwarming, but at the same time, like like oh my god, this is so overwhelming the reception we got from them. But it, it's been amazing the uh, the reception we get from like military personnel because we had the guys coming up and thanking us for making a, a TV show about farting, and it's like no, thank you for risking your life to keep us free, like. <laughs> You guys way more deserve thanks than we do. Uh, no. but it's, it, that was, We're that doing was God's work up here. <laughs> and uh, T Pain loves the show. T Pain, yeah, he tweeted yeah, that, it. That was that pretty was cool when he weird. tweeted about it. Yeah. Yeah. So five thousand troops in T Pain. <laughs> 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 Michelle, do you have a story? Is it T Pain? It is T Pain. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, right there. the fight scenes harder or the fast-paced dialogue scenes harder to film? Well, to <laughs> I'm not in the fight scenes. Usually, I'm usually on a lounge chair observing the fight <laughs> and telling people who to fight. And I always get a kick out of it because these boys and their fight scenes, it's just like the glee on their face <laughs> when they get to like run around and like wrestle. It's so... <laughs> It's so nerdy. It's insane how nerdy it is, and I just wanted that to be clear. So those are my favorite to watch because I'm just like you, dum dums. It, <laughs> it is super fun to pretend to be badass fighters. Uh, I don't know about like I went to theater art school, so <laughs> like the biggest fight that ever happened at my school was between two dance majors, and <laughs> those girls were vicious. So. Uh, uh, pr actually, probably the fight scenes are more difficult than the dialogue scenes because we're sitting down for the dialogue and we're up and moving. Uh, I don't know for the rest of the guys, but I, I spent a good few seasons at 350 pounds, so moving wasn't my favorite part. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. I lost 80 pounds. <laughs> um, I like the... Uh, I think the fight scenes are a little bit harder to film for me just because it's more involved with less talking. The talking stuff always goes super fast and it's really fun to do. Because of that, it seems to go much faster. There's a lot more of like a mouthful to take in, but it's just like, it's fun. And so those ones are great. And then the fight scenes, there's just a lot of angles to get everything to get like small shots. So it just takes a little bit longer. But other than that, you know, it is fun to fake punch people and make, you know, make these massive guys just go flying every in each direction. It's just like, well, it's not me, but this is great. <laughs> um, but then... Uh, <laughs> But then, yeah, the dialogue scenes are awesome. They're, they're, yeah, they're my favorite. They're my favorite for we sure, especially around the table. They're, yeah, they're my favorite. We do have an amazing uh, stunt coordinator and fight choreographer in Dan Skeen, who has uh, done most of the fights on the show and choreographed and, and done the stunt work for those. And uh, he is terrific and uh, takes a whole bunch of untrained actors and teaches us how to uh, properly execute a fight and has a lot of patience with very stupid guys. So. <laughs> That's off the skeeter. <laughs> All right, do we have time for one more? Is that okay? Cool. Uh, I'm trying to get someone back. Sorry, the lights. Right there. Yes. 
best advice for fledgling web series creators? Um, I think if Jared was here, he would just say, just, just do it, just make it. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to sell a show is incredibly difficult. Um, if you have the resources or in, to do a web series, you don't need, really need anything. Um, if you have an idea, just go and do it and put it up there. And uh, don't wait for anybody to say yes uh, to give you the support to do it. Just do it. And, and Jared did that, and uh, this is what it's turned into now. Yeah, you create, your own <coughs> you create your own proof of concept right away, right? So, I mean, you, you, it's, and it's also great for you to find out if it's working or if it's not working. Um, and, you know, it, uh, Mark's entirely right that, like, you don't need a mass amount of money. You don't need an enormous amount of resources to do something good or engaging. Um, just, uh, just do it. I, I, yeah, don't wait for someone to say yes to you, because they won't. But also, also be a little bit, uh, you know, ruthless with it as well, because um, Nate and Jared did uh, two other videos before turning Letterkenny Problems, um, which were quite successful, but not to the same degree as Letterkenny Problems. Um, so, you know, Jared was constantly tweaking and figuring out, okay, what's, what's resonating? Um, and that's, that's what, uh, what spawned the series itself. So keep making, but also keep trying to get it better and, and tweak it and uh, um, constantly trying to improve. Yeah, there's definitely, there's a time to just let it go. If it's something that's not working, there's the time to quit pushing, but also uh, in, the, in the beginning, just keep going, 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 that's it. There's nothing else to it. And then hopefully something hits, but also, yeah, know when to be ruthless and just be like, okay, this either sucks or this is not attracting the audience that I want to, what can we do to change this? And other than that, yeah, man, get out and do it. And that's the only thing that kind of works. Because again, like Jacob said, proof of concept is right there. And you can make it for much cheaper than trying to film a real pilot um, because that's quite expensive. And then, uh, yeah, just keep going for sure. Keep going and going. All right, well, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thank you, thanks everybody. Thank, thank, thank you. That last gentleman, we got something in the back for you. All right, thank you. Thank you. ATX. <laughs>